these gentlemen together. So, in your work at Bosch on, this is the health buddy? Yes. Um, where did the consumer insights come from, and how did you start? What you see here is um, the health buddy system from Bosch Healthcare. It's actually an acquisition of a Silicon Valley company. I think there's some people here in the audience today that were a part of where this originally came from. So this, what we're seeing right now with the health buddy is the patient interface that's in their home. And it's been actively used for over 10 years. So the form factor really hasn't changed in that amount of time. And if, over, right now though, there's about tens of thousands of individuals that are on the Bosch Healthcare telehealth systems. And in the early days, I wasn't there, but there was definitely a lot of consumer insights that went into building the device. And if you actually feel it, you can, you can touch how like, it feels so nice in the hands. And we looked at the individuals that typically use this product are frail elders, 75 plus, managing a chronic disease. And so oftentimes they have loss of vision, loss of hearing, a little bit of dexterity in the fingers. And so there's one of the specific things I love the story is that there's actually a test done pushing the blue buttons, and would the device <coughs> move across the table, or would it stay there as somebody was pushing on it? So, it hasn't changed over time, and it's been very successful and used with um, the population that it's focused on. Sorry, I'm going to be passing this back and forth. Um, I, I think there is a little bit, some of what I'm seeing out there, and neither one of you can respond to this, is the, there's a big difference between business information, like the size of the demographic, or the existence of a large demographic of people, or a disease state, and a true human insight that can inform design. And I, I think there's a, a lack of clarity around that for some people who are out there trying to innovate. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I could take that. Um... There is an overemphasis on analytical processes. I think all around the uh, country or culture in general, but I do think that uh, the big issues that typically we are presented with are conflicting. Um, and um, a good uh, design process actually creates a, something more homogeneous and more, I would say, holistic of a solution which is inherently some kind of a very intricate compromise between different aspects and different uh, data points. And that is the source of failure of a lot of um, uh, approaches that um, try to, in a very methodical way, um, create a scientific approach towards design. And those are typically the, the failure points that the, the holistic, the, the overarching theme is, is missing and there are a lot of uh, disconnected answers to uh, divergent amounts of problems. Would you like to take a look at the case study that you shared with us? Because I think it's kind of on point for what you're talking about. So uh, this is a, what we call a wellness device. It's, uh, it's a Fitbit uh, tracker. And it's uh, about a finger size and it's, uh, yep. <laughs> And the interesting story about it is that it's a device that started by not being a pedometer. Uh, the notion was that we want to uh, create a, a pedometer that is created, uh, connected to the web, but it mustn't look like anything close to a pedometer. And um, the end result, as you see here, is something that is uh, somewhat uh, reminiscent of um, an old old um, cloth bag or something along that line, a uh, clip, uh, very minimal. Um, the screen is actually completely um, obscured most of the time. Only when you press it, you could actually um, get uh, steps counts or calorie counts, but um, uh, the glory moment is actually when the flower blossoms, um, which is uh, a little thing that we added uh, Essentially, if you've been good today and you walk the five miles, you get a flower. Um, and that has been, um, you know, a very soft touch that we felt is really essential for Fitbit. Uh, okay, more slides. Uh, so, uh, typically, uh, if you look at the world of uh, health or fitness devices, you, uh, you'll see a very bifurcated uh, worldview. Um, 
the device inherently was more geared towards uh, women, urban women. And you'll see, this is a very uh, dominant view of fitness. Um, uh, needless to mention, uh, all the social, cultural, philosophical aspects associated with that. But uh, the next one is actually also a problematic one. It's a very performance-oriented approach, very prescribed. If you uh, lost uh, a pound, you're good. If you didn't lose the pound, you're bad, and so on. And uh, what we highlighted earlier on, that there is a third approach um, that is out there uh, on and off, which is more a holistic approach, more of a wellness uh, type of, uh, uh, I'd say, uh, marketing uh, strategy. And the next slide, I think, will show that when we looked at this in a triangle, uh, we saw that everyone in the market is along the lines of fitness, fitness to well, uh, weight loss. And we, uh, together with the guys at Fitbit, really wanted to position somewhere else. And now that you see the initial device and the flower and it's being somewhat ambiguous in its functionality, you could see how it fits into the wellness uh, approach, which is a more subtle, more soft, more well-rounded, rather than uh, performance-based. I think this is the last one. Okay. Okay. Um, Gaddy, I was really interested in something you said when we were preparing for this panel, and I sort of like both of you to share your thoughts on this. You said there's just too much binary thinking going on design space right now. It's either young versus old, beautiful versus usable, and I think we heard Hartman say something about that as well, actually a lot about that as well, and I'd like to hear the two of you sort of comment on what, what that really means and what it's turning design into. So maybe I'll start because I, I heard that the, the, the real issue is that designers in many cases today are being pegged into, uh, in many cases, the wrong hole. Uh, you uh, will take uh, a product that was already uh, predetermined and then you just, you know, gloss over and do some kind of, you know, uh, cosmetics on top of it. Um, the same goes to marketing and business strategies. You see products that are really pegged in uh, really narrow holes, you know, it needs to be uh, gearing towards uh, people aged 25 to 32. Uh, so these are really, uh, I think, very limited uh, worldviews. I think, uh, as I showed here, is that the, the design has a holistic value. Design that is good for age 32 is definitely good for age 60. And, you know, if somebody age 15 use it, they'll enjoy it as well. So design definitely needs uh, to encompass all that. And um, a lot of the mechanisms, the processes instilled within the design communities are also catered to look at that very narrow-minded approach. And I do want to re-emphasize that the, the more uh, cultural, the more broad view of design that is holistic and look at the functionality together with aesthetics and culture. Uh, ask broader questions rather than uh, delivering um, answers to narrow questions. I, I want to echo the idea that it's a holistic system. In regards to the, the healthcare technology that Bosch Healthcare provides, is definitely we have a significant focus on the end user, the, the, the person at home. And they often get pegged into being a patient labeled with their condition. But in reality, the reality there's a whole healthcare team that is behind them, that's supporting them. And then there's the sort of silent, unknown ecosystem of caregivers that are around that patient or person at home. And so even though our Bosch Healthcare has this direct connection to the patient through the device, we understand that there's an ecosystem of care informally and formally that really has to be part of the system to make it successful. So I want to go a little bit deeper with this idea of emotional and cultural context, because to me that's where the insights grow from. Can you talk a little about how you put that into practice in your, in your organization? So, um, I'll, I'll give you an example. We are doing some uh, medical uh, devices work, and uh, one of the toughest issues always has been the color. 
So uh, it's amazing. You walk into uh, very fancy lobbies or very well-to-do companies that really decorate it beautifully and you ask them what color will this device be and it's always either white or some kind of a putty gray or blue maybe. And it's, that is medical, quote unquote. However, we are uh, very emotional animals and we like colors and colors have actually scientifically proven positive psychological effects. And when I talk about that, there's just an example talking about culture, the medical device is within the home. The home is a very um, amiable, uh, culturally loaded uh, environment and we definitely want it to be um, uh, as vibrant and as quote unquote cool as a, the best furniture in the home. And that, that is one example that a lot of my fights with medical device manufacturers is about creating some of that level of, uh, let's say, cultural grounding that is so essential into making a product, not a medical device, but as a, you know, a, just a good companion to live with. Um, Derek Bill, the Bosch Healthcare has that, has that putty hue to it. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it is, there is, I mean, it does have a look of a medical device. And I think that in regards to the emotional connection, there are, are countless uh, stories that we receive back from individuals that grow an emotional attachment to having the health buddy system in their home. And I think that speaks to perhaps more than just the physical device. It's the whole, it's the experience of being connected. And I think that's one of the key things that we're listening to in regards to that. In addition to the device, it's the experience that wrap, that's wrapped around the whole system. Jason, when I first met you, you were a blogger. You had good design, HL. And I would like you to just share sort of what the genesis of that was and how you sort of ended up in this space. Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, I began to write good design, HL because, like many people probably in this room, you had an experience with caring for an older a parent or an older adult. And I've had many of those experiences in different ways, long distance and hands on. And I just kept running into problems and holes. And I was just, it was really frustrating in regards to trying to find products to help in the caregiving situation. And so the idea behind Good Design Age Well was just to collect and celebrate my, things that I could find that represented, in my point of view, good design. As a way to sort of, you know, I'd love to collect everything in a room just to give people inspiration that there are other designers that are out there that are looking at an amazing opportunity of designing for this specific. Um, demographic shift we're facing. So it's basically to celebrate good design. So I want to approach the term universal design because it's one of those either much loved or much hated terms. <laughs> I'm anxious to hear your thoughts on that. Um, but it seems to me that universal design has almost become synonymous with what was it, Jody called it, geezer design or um, or um, ugly. I mean, <laughs> just not to put too fine a point on it, just not, not attractive. And are we ever going to get around that? Do we need, I, I always get kind of pissed when people talk about creating new words for things to sort of guilt, you know, you know <laughs> try to make it less ugly. But do we need new terminology? Do we need, um, obviously we picked move beyond age as sort of a get over the age thing and let's just design things well was the concept. But, you know, what, what is it? Why is universal design sort of stuck in this place? Well, uh, it's a euphemism. So that's uh, kind of a very direct answer to that. But the, the, the real underlying issue is that um, the perception is that the person who is using this device is a patient. It's not first and foremost a person. And then they have uh, problems and needs to be solved. Again, a very uh, prescribed uh, question answer, rather than a more holistic, okay, this is a device that could help and could uh, heighten uh, certain uh, aspects of the life, at the same time needs to blend very well into the life. So when you are taking a more holistic and harmonious uh, approach towards design, you don't need universal design. 
the design, just good design will do the job. And obviously a certain device will need to deliver certain functions better than, let's say, a chair, but it still needs to be as beautiful as the chair next to it. And I think um, uh, that, that's the core issue. With, with, once you started segregating into a different methodology, a different um, community of professionals that deal with specifically universal design, you uh, segregated it away from the design and a holistic cultural uh, approach in general. Well, uh, I have a wish, and I think a wish is that there just becomes more opportunities for all of us to experience either uh, a product or my, my other hobby is, is a built environment that takes in consideration, without any other words, universal design, because it's such an amazing experience to be able to go into a space that has these elements in it. And especially if you're going through that space with somebody who perhaps has a wheeled mobility device with them. And I think from if we can have more of those experiences, hopefully it will become something that will be embraced as opposed to you know, ignored.